Uh, good afternoon. I'm Monica Hendrickson, Public Health Administrator for Peoria City County Health Department, and welcome to the Tri-County COVID Update. For today, we are seeing 87,210 Tri-County residents that have had COVID since we began reporting in March of 2020. I'd like to also note that this week, we also recognize the two-year anniversary of the first Illinoisan to have had COVID. So again, it's been two years since we've been operating in uh, this type of new normal for us. The total number of cases uh, equates to an increase of 4,168 new cases over the past week alone. That includes 2,106 new cases in Peoria County, 1,564 new cases in Tazewell over the past week, and then for Woodford, it was 498 new cases over the past week. This week, we also report an additional 28 deaths in the Tri-County, bringing our total to 1,036. That includes 16 additional deaths in Peoria, bringing the total to 510, 10 in Tazewell County, bringing it to 409, and two additional deaths in Woodford, bringing it to 117. Uh, we will not be reporting on home isolating and hospitalized cases, uh, again, partly because of Tazewell uh, in trying to make comparisons. But I know for Peoria, we are still in the um, upper 50s and 60s regarding the number of Peoria County residents that are currently hospitalized. Our tri-counties case count dipped from last week. Last week, we were at 667 new cases each day. We're now under 600 at 595. Peoria specifically also saw a decrease. Last week, we were averaging 333 new cases each day, and now we are at 301. In addition, we've seen our hospitalization stabilize. While our ICU capacity remains relatively um, unchanged with 39 ICU beds averaging in use each day, um, we did see a decrease in our non-ICU beds dropping to 175 amongst the two hospital systems. Today, they're actually reporting 36 ICU beds in use and 119 non-ICU beds. And sadly, they're reporting six additional deaths in the past 24 hours. Overall, our numbers are improving. Um, but this is still a long road ahead of us. Just because we're not feeling that rush of pressure um, that we were seeing a few weeks ago, it does not mean that we are able to um, stop working continuously on trying to stem the continuous spread of this virus. Um, to speak in terms of what this means in terms of implications on two of the largest sectors that have been involved and have seen how COVID can continue to play an impact, um, we first have Beth Kreider, Peoria County Regional Superintendent. Good afternoon. My name is Beth Kreider. I'm the regional superintendent for Peoria County and I represent the school districts in this region and there are 18 of them that two years started down this journey of what does it mean to face a global pandemic in the modern education system. We had a meeting back then on a Monday morning via Zoom, this new tool we were all using, and we thought that would last for a couple weeks. We have now been meeting for two years and we with a few holidays off, of course. So we get together on those Zoom calls and we talk about the implications of the changing in guidance, the changing in guidelines as science learns more. We get together and talk about the implications of vaccines and who's vaccinated and who is not and masking and all looking for commonalities and how we can work together. So I would like to start by saying, first of all, as Peoria County superintendents, we are so grateful to our partners at the Peoria City County Health Department because they are always willing to jump on that Zoom call and to support us with our questions and sometimes our grievances as to what we do to move forward. And it's been an incredible partnership that has allowed us to weather this storm. COVID is still with us in our classrooms and we are adjusting. So there are times when we are quarantining children and educators and other people that play critical roles in the education system that is causing critical staffing shortages. 
that has been one of the most serious implications in the most latest variant because it is so contagious. So we're having to come up with different strategies on how to cover those classrooms and what it might mean to have to go to remote learning. So again, thank you to the Monica Hendrickson and the Peoria City County Health Department because we need to work that out in consultation with them if we have to go back to remote learning. Looking forward, a couple messages that I would like to share are, there is a critical court case that is to uh, be decided this Friday and if it should rule in favor of the plaintiffs that we um, in some school districts may not have to respond to the mask mandate. While that may happen this Friday and it most surely will go to the appellate court, that will issue in changes in how we quarantine. We are able to access the new guidelines from the CDC of that five-day quarantine because we rigorously and aggressively mask in our public schools. So there would be some changes there if a school district is no longer masking everyone. And it will still be our recommendation moving forward because we want everyone in school every day and not have to use the remote learning option. And lastly, I'll say this. We've learned a lot in this pandemic. We've learned how to celebrate differently. We've learned how to group differently. We've learned how to deliver educationally differently. As a matter of fact, we had to in 40 hour, 48 hours completely change the entire educational system to go online. We need to take some of those lessons forward. We learned some really good things. Yes, COVID has had its challenges, mental health struggles, grief over things that we didn't get to attend, but some good things happened as well that we need to carry forward. And I'm hoping we can see those used in the future. Anyone got questions? With, with the mask mandate possibly with the, the decision on Friday, which is going to be a time limitation, right? This is what you covered in the field? That is absolutely our understanding. Okay. Um, so, so some districts might drop the mask mandate, but you as the, the overriding, overriding are still going to recommend it? Of, of absolutely, we're going to recommend it. The It's back to the beginning of social distancing, washing your hands, and wearing a mask are our best strategies in that congregate setting where we're all together in one space and eating together and in classrooms together, that masking is our best tool moving forward to stop the spread. Well, you know, it seems like I would call some of these districts that would want, that wanted to drop the mask mandate, they all had provisions for if cases were so high, then they would mask up. Do you know specifically which districts would be dropping the mask mandate at this point? Because cases are still pretty high. I do know that we have several school districts in Peoria County that are involved in the lawsuit, whether it's from the parent point of view because they're representing their children or from the educator or staff member that works in the district. Um, all those court cases were consolidated and it's being heard in the, in the Sangamon court system. So um, I don't have an exact list of which all of those are involved in that court case, but we will continue to recommend best practices because it will go to the appellate court and we'll see where it goes from there. But you can't say specifically who might be dropping the mask mandate on Friday? I do not. Do you know the vaccination status among uh, the five family-year-olds in Peoria County? So I know um, the vaccines were made available you know, through the schools. Uh, has there been a, a big uptick in those? There has. That is a better Monica question, but we, we worked really hard before the Christmas season when we knew families would be gathering to encourage families to vaccinate their younger children. But I don't know if you have information on that or where it can be found. So regarding the uh, 5 through 11, um, you know, we have about a little over 35 percent of the age range that is in some form or fashion in their vaccine status, whether it's first dosing or getting their second dosing. I, mean, I believe the state has active numbers off of their website by county level. Um, I will say kind of to also add to the conversations around the masking mandate is that what we are seeing in terms of our cases when we are working through these cases a lot of times, it is that our younger population, our school age po population that's not fully vaccinated yet or not even eligible to be vaccinated, for the example, the under five, um, they are still very good at being carriers of the virus and bringing it into their households, which then leads to other employers feeling the brunt of staffing shortages because now all of a sudden,
families that might be uh, have been vaccinated, but because they're in a household contact and exposure is just repeated, repeated, and especially with younger children, you know, there's cuddles, there's lovies, you know, you can't really stay away from them as you do with your coworkers, so to speak. Um, it can lead to, again, those issues within a workplace. So the staffing shortages that you see at school districts, as well as in our healthcare, and we'll have uh, Bob Anderson speak more to that, you know, they're stemming a lot from household exposures. And again, that population of young children is really important for them to get vaccinated if eligible, and then to continue to mask. It seems like it's really bad timing. I mean, with, with, with Omicron being so infected, to kick off the, the mask mandate. I think I'll respond that I'm not a lawyer, so I am waiting to see how that uh, goes forward on Friday. And from there, we will respond, and then we will wait until the appellate court has their ruling. Um, each school district has their own law firm that represents them and gives them legal advice as well. But it will be the encouragement and the um, recommendation that we continue to socially distance and mask and wash our hands. I think a lot about that first grader that's never been in school before that missed that critical socialization of that kindergarten year. And we're very aware of those things in the school system. It shows up every day. Research is saying that developmentally, because school is so important to the development of a child, that developmentally kids are showing up almost two years behind, not academically, but just in that socialization. So a ninth grader is really more seventh grader. And so we're very aware of that and we're, we're we're tuning into that and providing interventions. And I find that there is a lot of grief around that idea of two full high school years being interrupted by COVID, which leads me to masking could not be more important because if you are infected and you are isolating or have to quarantine, you miss out on that basketball game or you can't go to the best way for us to gather for prom or for graduation and all those things that we remember from when we were in high school. The best way to get to those events and celebrations is to continue to do the big three things that we know protect us from the spread. The question that you had, Leslie, regarding is this an appropriate time or not an appropriate time, uh, similar to um, Beth, I am not a lawyer, um, but I can just say that with the number of cases that we are seeing, even though it is decreasing our case count, we also need to recognize that this is still going to be a low number because people are able to access testing at home. It's not reportable. And so, again, this is going to be a low number that we have. In addition, I would also just recommend that what Beth said and kind of iterate this fact that a lot of the guidance documents that we have for schools and how they operate are based on aggressive masking in the classroom. We're able to be within three feet of each other because of masking. We're able to not necessarily isolate or quarantine an entire classroom because of masking. And so while this lawsuit might give uh, leeways in terms of the ability to require it, it does not change the definitions of quarantine and isolation in accordance. So again, I would just highly recommend that masking is proven once, uh, time and time again for the past few years that it is an effective way to stop the spread along with vaccinations and social distancing. And we have created policies to allow kids to be in school to get that type of socialization because I have a first grader. I understand what it means to have those years lost, that we want to make sure that we can keep as many kids in play as possible. So again, I think it is imperative to keep on masking. Um, the other, uh, you know, kind of talk more a little bit about how we are moving down this trend and what does it mean, uh, and again, to talk about what that long term, how do we continue on this right path of improvement. And we have Bob Anderson, uh, president of OSF St. Francis. 
Thank you, Monica. Um, it's a pleasure to get to uh, come and address this group again. Um, I was here a few weeks ago and shared some of the challenges as a hospital that we're experiencing with this Omicron surge. Um, I'm pleased to say that our numbers, um, as has been reported nationally, are drifting downward slightly, which is a relief uh, for us. We still have um, staffing shortages um, because we have probably about 20% higher absentee rate right now amongst our mission partners at St. Francis uh, due to uh, call-offs for a variety of reasons. They can be because maybe they have small children um, that um, have to be quarantined or, or have illness, or maybe they, even though they're vaccinated, have become ill because someone in their household that they're repeatedly exposed to has COVID. Um, we reported a couple of weeks ago that we had long delays in our emergency department and in bringing patients in from the region. Uh, we still do have delays, but they are shorter. Um, we're pleased to be able to uh, bring people who need advanced care here in Peoria uh, from the region in a more timely uh, manner. So we're, we're grateful that we can do that. Uh, but I would reiterate what's been said before. We can't let our guard down. Um, we may have taken a step backwards or two from a precipice of really being in a very um, difficult spot in healthcare, but we're by no means in the clear. Um, we have requested and have been told we will get additional staffing resources from the state of Illinois. We don't have the date that those resources will arrive, uh, but they are locums, uh, nurses, and respiratory therapists uh, that will be assigned to St. Francis um, for six weeks uh, to help us to bridge uh, this staffing gap. Um, in addition to what's been reiterated about masking and washing your hands and social distancing, I would just add um, the importance of being vaccinated and boosted. Um, the patients that we are taking care of are by far and away unvaccinated. Um, and it's really those conversations with families who have a loved one pass away um, at, at a relatively young age that may have been prevented had they um, had that vaccination. So we continue to press on that. It's really the way uh, to stop this cycle and to get us out of the pandemic. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. All right, I'll turn it back over to Monica. I'll open up to any additional questions. So uh, the question being, have we passed our peak of Omicron? Um, for reportable cases, so again, I want to reiterate, our case count is a low value of what the true virus level is in our community because of at-home testing capabilities that people are taking advantage of. But from a reportable standpoint, we are on the decline. But it doesn't mean that you know we're out of the woods yet because, again, our hospitalizations, while they are decreasing, and stabilizing as well as our ICU capacity, all of those things are things that don't happen overnight and take time to get corrected. Again, ICUs for COVID patients, that's uh, you know more than a seven day window of time that they're in the ICU. So it's not, again, that light switch we wish it was. So there's still a long journey to get back out of this, this current surge. So again, to the point that was made, masking, distancing, hygiene, and vaccines, and especially boosters, are really important for the next stage so that when we do kind of start that down uh, that down slope we can really aggressively see the correctiveness of it based on the fact that we've had all these protective measures in place um how does the death rate currently compare um i would say it, it's on one of our higher ends now we've had um, ebbs and flows in some of our are deaths related to, especially when we've had before vaccines, outbreaks in nursing homes, where you would see a considerable change in our death rates as well as our um, mortality. I think what we are seeing though, sadly, is the fact that you have a highly acute illness of unvaccinated individuals and that when they get Omicron, their uh, prognosis is not great. 
Um, and the hospitals, you know, report to us routinely about ICU capacity, uh, bed capacity, and then how many deaths they've had in the past 24 hours. And sadly, you can see the number pretty much reflect that when an ICU bed sometimes becomes available, it sometimes also means that there's another, another death in that capacity. So again, when you saw such a surge in cases, you saw an increase in number of ICU and high acuity patients, we saw a higher death rate. So in terms of our nursing home population, especially now with vaccines, uh, what we are seeing is that boosted makes a difference. So we did, again, when we boosters were available, push a lot of that into our nursing home population to make sure that they were one of the first to get the vaccine, make sure they were one of the first to get the booster so that their immunity was built up. We do see cases related to staffing, breakthrough cases in their staffing, but compared to when you'd see that in previous um, variants, the amount of mortality is considerably down. We're not sending 20 patients into the hospitals because of, a, of an outbreak at a nursing home. And usually it's related to a lot of comorbidities that exist with that patient, um, and severe comorbidities. So again, vaccines have been not only helping overall illness in our general population, but even in our nursing home population, it is saving lives each day. So our Peoria County Jail has sustained a, a couple of outbreaks that they have worked through, and they continue to, I think, always do the right thing, which is fantastic to have such a strong partnership with our sheriff, Sheriff uh, Brian Asbell. And partly that is, one, he uh, really promoted vaccinations and made it very readily available for us to be in the jail, giving it not only to detainees, but also to staff, as well as doing testing and follow-up with his, his correctional officers. So. Again, our sheriff's department has done everything um, to really control the spread of um, COVID in the jail setting. Sadly, though, they're fighting against the fact that it is a jail and it's a congregate living setting that people live in close proximity to. And so with any type of congregate setting, that's going to be always high risk, whether it's a jail, a homeless shelter, or even a nursing home. So vaccinations and congregate settings are going to be the most important thing you can do. Uh, in terms of testing rapid tests, I know you can't count rapid tests, but do you recommend those to take a rapid test and whether or not they're trusted or don't trust it, they should go ahead and get a PCR test so that way we can have a more accurate data? So, uh, you know, if you are testing and using an at-home rapid test, first and foremost, I hope you're isolating because if you're showing symptoms, you know, and especially in the situation we're in, isolate yourself immediately. If your rapid comes back positive, you know, if you uh, talk to your employer, make sure they know that you've done a rapid, it is positive. Um, adhere to what that results mean. You know, start masking up, social, you know, stay away from individuals for 10 days, whether it's five days, and then mask afterwards. Um, now, if your employer for some reason needs to have that follow-up uh, PCR test, or if you're not sure why you, you don't remember having exposure points or what have you, then definitely follow up with a PCR, but as soon as you, I mean, at-home tests are really helpful. I mean, we've taken them at our house, peace of mind. Somebody has a sniffle, we want to test quickly. We don't know that they don't have an exposure. And then we usually follow up with a, a PCR to verify. But those at-homes are really helpful so that you can isolate as fast as possible. And that's key. Moving forward, it's going to be really about if you're sick, isolate. So try to get into isolation as fast as possible. You know, going off the test, we've still been seeing some people worried about the black side word, more of the random testing sites and things like that. Uh, do we have a number of maybe how many complaints were sent to the Center for COVID Control and maybe they've stepped in or done anything about that? Um, I don't know uh, locally how many complaints were set in. I know that our own health department has shared information with the state uh, and in terms of that site, but I think that was more directed to the uh, state's attorney general's office. Yeah. And I also want to kind of go back a little bit and touch on some of the outbreaks. We've also been getting some reports of globally even more variants popping up. Should, should we be concerned about some of these, or is there any like in our own country that may have popped up that we should kind of have on our radar? So with a virus, you're going to always have variants. That's what viruses do best, sadly, is mutate. Um, 
you know, in terms of concerns about them, we're always monitoring them. That's where the public health surveillance system that exists between partnerships with private and healthcare labs, you know, works in conjunction so that we can catch them. We're on Omicron. Between Delta and Omicron, there's a lot of other Greek alphabet uh, letters there. And that's because we were able to, you know, monitor what that variant did or did not do. So we're always going to be monitoring variants. In terms of our own peace of mind, the best thing you can do, regardless of what type of variants are coming, is continue doing those non-pharmaceutical interventions, masking, socially distancing, but then recognizing that the vaccines work, even for the variants that we are seeing. They are effective against that, so making sure you are vaccinated and up-to-date in your vaccine, meaning get your booster. Are more people getting vaccinated in the same way area, or what do you attribute this uh, sort of downtrend in cases to? I think there's a couple of reasons why we're seeing the downtrend in cases. One, um, we're running out of hosts, meaning there's not a lot of people that haven't gotten sick. And as much as we want to kind of think about that with a shrug, it's how, again, viruses work. They need to have a, a new host to go to. Um, we're also seeing an increase in vaccines. And again, I want to reiterate the health department is still offering seven days a week walk-in vaccine clinics, all types, uh, five and older. And so taking advantage of that, we've noticed that a lot of people have. I will say, um, one of the things I think we can always make sure we better communicate is that we really need to look at boosters. You know, guidance has, it's a significant change that it's no longer fully vaccinated. It is up to date. And up to date means boosted. And so I, I'm asking everyone not to just get fully vaccinated now, it's to be up to date in their vaccines. So taking that next step, you know, thank you for getting your first round of vaccines, but now we need you to get your booster. Um, I think that's going to help attribute us in that decline. An Omicron booster specifically? Um, I'm not sure. You know, I think they are working on that. I think we're also looking for the under five population to be eligible finally for a vaccine, which I know there's individuals in this room that are counting the days for that to happen as well. So I think we have a lot of steps into play. Um, you know, I believe Pfizer is looking at a specific Omicron variant uh, to address, but we, you know, I think this is going to be the next iteration of our vaccines is recognizing that. Is this going to be something that we continue to get boosted on? Is this a seasonal thing such as influenza? Uh, and I think we're going to learn a lot more about vaccines um, through the spring and summer. Yeah, those, uh, oops, sorry. Okay. Uh, just really quick, those additional weekend days that you guys have for the walk-ins, is that something that's going to be staying a lot more long-term still, or is there kind of an end date where that might be starting to phase out? Right now, the health department will be offering those vaccines throughout the weekends through the end of February. Um, and then we'll reassess as we continue to do so. So if we see another interest, especially if, for example, some of the kids that um, are groups of individuals that were eligible start coming back online for getting or now eligible for booster, we want to make sure we're readily available for that population to easily access. Um, but as of right now, they're going to go through February and we'll reassess accordingly. And those weekdays, those will stay the same after February? Um, we hope to, or we're going to kind of incorporate them into daily operations as well. Has our weekend clinics been popular? Um, they have. They kind of ebb and flow with the, the, the seasonality of things. Um, but I believe they, we've, you know, we've, some days we've seen over 100, and other days we've seen maybe like 50, 60. But again, that's 50 or 60 people that have gotten some type of their vaccine. And that's, that's what we can ask for at this point in time. Do you have the percentage of how many right now really are up to date on their vaccine? Um, I do not have that information available for how many are up to date. Well, thank you, everyone. We will um, most likely be doing our next pre press briefing on February, Thursday, February 10th, I believe is the actual date. Um, so we'll look forward to seeing you guys then. Thank you.